time, this opportunity that we have to just to study, to gather around you, the living word, and what you've left behind as testimony of you and your written word. So we ask that we would have a love and respect for the written word, but only because it leads us to you, the living word, the God, the Father, the Creator, our Savior, our everything, that you are the place and source and person of value that defines us, uh, that gives us meaning in our life. It's easy to forget that going through a, a work day, through regular life situations, and but once we're reminded of it, it's so easy to, to know why that is true. So we ask now more than ever that you would continue to be our counselor, our guide, our director, our shepherd, our high priest, our God, our savior in this time to answer these questions, to show us the insight of, of your word and what it means and states about you and just to have us to be able to understand uh, more and more of these things about your word and about you so that help us to be true to ourselves so we can be better in our relationships with each other to show your love to be the emissaries of you who are the god of love that we would be your people your servants your children of love so we thank you that that uh, you came with grace and truth and we now ask you to give us the grace and truth of your word and the answers to what we seek in knowing more about you so father we lifted everything up and we just lean on you for all the answers and for all the insight and for everything that we are and do become and how we are and uh, have been we know it's it's all in your will so we just thank you for everything and we ask all this in jesus or peter's name amen all right so today's q a which is a q a and we're supposed to have it the first friday of the month but last friday just to be reality about that is that two things happened one i didn't mention it so, uh-oh, wasn't time to get the questions in. And then secondly, it didn't work out good anyway because I was bombarded with a short week. That was one of the toughest short weeks I've ever had, going back to work and taking down Christmas. Uh, we still have Christmas inside our house, like everywhere. Um, but outside, it's all good. It's all down. Uh, <clears throat> so, with that being said, good Lord has been good and uh, continue to have a fresh new start at the new year and looking forward to uh, what he's going to do this year and people who... Uh, like myself and, and others, I know sometimes we get anxious and we think, when is this going to ever come to an end? When are we off this rat race, this rat wheel, this, this, this wheel of, of constant you know, chasing? Just remember that any time the year, the year comes and the year goes, uh, it's one more opportunity to reflect and remember and to count uh, the blessings of God that he's already bestowed on us. And it's another year for an opportunity to grow and change and, and forgive and restore and to reconcile uh, and just to be better. So every time he delays, if you will, or gives us one more day, one more day, one more month, one more year, that's a good thing. It's not a frustrating thing. It's a good thing. It gives us one more opportunity for us and our loved ones to, to be better uh, in a big, in a, in a spot where we need to be from what he's called us to do and whatever the measure of grace and faith he gave us. So with that being said, we had five questions. Two come from Brother Todd, two come from Sister Laney, and one comes from Sister Pam. Um, in order of how I receive them, it's Todd, then Laney, then, then Pam. And that's how I always address them. There's no partiality here. I always make that clear. I just address them in the order in which I get them. And so with the reality of this being sta stated, uh, Todd's asked me about the thief on the cross and to elaborate on some things there, what happens to him and, and other, other matters, and we'll look at that. Luke 22, verses 24 to 30, talks about the, the apostles and the greatest and the least and the tr judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Laney talks about Matthew and Luke, uh, referring to the sparrows and the different mentionings of how that aligns. And then also in Timothy, the referencing to blasphemy and what that's speaking to. And Sister Pam talks about in John 10, uh, the issue of the thief coming to steal, kill, and destroy, and what that's about. So those are the questions we have now. If there are others, and I did not get those, and if I forgot something, then I, I apologize. God knows that's happened because, you know, I'm not there sometimes. So... If I did forget something or if you have additional question, please, as I'm talking now, type that in and we will be more than happy to address that as the Lord wills and as the Lord permits for us to do so. Um, but I never want to shut you out or ever make you feel like it's too late, never too late. And unless we're no longer breathing or not on this planet, then it's never too late. So <laughs> always ask me any question that you want. I won't have the answer all the time, but I'll do the best I can. All right. so. Todd's question, thief on the cross. 
So with that being said, we need to turn to the passages that are referencing the thief on the cross. So I want to make sure that we turn to, I'm going to write these on the board here for you. So there's Matthew, and I put Matthew uh, 27, 38, and 44. And then there's Mark 15. Twenty-seven and twenty-eight, and then also verse thirty-two, and then there is Luke, and that's going to be chapter twenty-three, verse thirty-two to forty-three. And the question that Brother Todd has is, where is his spirit and soul today? What will happen to him at the Bema seat? Day seven, will he be where? Does he have an experience in Gehenna or Hades or both or what or how, when? So the basic genre of this is who is this? Not by name, of course, and you're asking from a spiritual state, where is he, spiritually speaking, and a state of, you know, where he's at. And then secondly, what happens to him because of that? And the first part of it is just the import of who is it, right? And that's going to help to unravel everything else. It's like once you pull up that thread, it kind of just, you know, finds itself. So let's go again to Matthew 27, the first part of this, Matthew 27, and we will look at verse 38. In Matthew 27, verse 38, and he says, at the same time, two robbers, which by the way, it's alluding, which is interesting. I love how husband and wife here, Todd and Pam, I don't think they collaborated this by any means. But I think it's interesting that Todd asked about a thief on a cross, and Pam asked about the thief who's going to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief, I'm going to give a little spoiler alert, the thief here that Pam talks about is a stealth mode thief. Because that's the word that's used in the Greek language. It's a stealth mode type of thief. Whereas the thief here is not describing the type of thief he is other than just saying he's just a thief, he's a robber. He's one that just takes. So this type of thief is being described specifically as one who does it in stealth mode. Whereas here, a thief here, just he's mentioning that he is, that's why it translates itself into the word robber, or it says robbers. And some translations also later on, they're going to be called, well, not some translations, some passages later on, they're going to be called malefactors or criminals. So it's just a general term of the type of criminal they are, not so much how they do their activity. So John 10 is about how it's done versus here it's just what they do. They steal, okay? So they're thieves. So in Matthew, again, 27, 38, at the same time, two robbers were crucified with him, one at his right hand and the other at his left. And of course, I mentioned on the board also verse 44, because in verse 44 it says, those robbers also who were crucified with him reproached him. As in, they reviled him. They actually, as it says here, so when they reproached him, what's interesting is it says robbers reproached, which is the word, it's also can translate it reviled, which is the actual Greek word. I'm write this out for you. Where did I write it here? Medio. All right, so that's in Matthew. So in order to figure out the question, we first have to do a little, you know, crime dog McGruff, if you will, a little Columbo, a little Perry Mason, a little gathering of data from the crime scene and see and let's find out material facts about said individual. We don't know his name, but we know a little bit about him. But we're going to find out there's interesting things here because I'm not – doing anything so far, just gathering information, then I'm going to give you the conclusion. But first I want you to see that you're asking about a singular thief on the cross, but in Matthew it talks about robbers, one on his left, one on his right. But we're going to find as we continue to unveil this, there's a little interesting things here. So let's go over to Mark in chapter 15. In Mark 15, this may be more involved than you intended, Brother Todd, but hey, that's just the way 
Lord goes sometimes, or maybe just right on time to what you thought to. Who knows? So Matthew 15, verse 27, 28, says, And with him they crucified two robbers, one at his right hand and one at his left. And that scripture was verified. It says, here goes the first clue. Not only are they people that, that rob and steal, they rob from God. We don't know, because when you're not, when you're not sanctified, when you're not reconciled to God, when you're not behaving, you're not being obedient, we're all robbing from God. We're all stealing from him his just rights that he has as a creator over his creation. He has a right as a master over his servants to tell us how to live. He has a right to indicate to us this is what your role and responsibility is, and you must do it. He has a right to do that because you haven't figured this out. He's God, right? But at the same time, What's interesting is that when you go through the fact that people say, well, how can God be a jealous God? He's jealous of his creation, not nothing about you he's jealous about, which is what people like Oprah misunderstand because they just don't have the screw loose or whatever. Not the screws loose, I say. They don't have it all. <laughs> Sorry. So the reality is he's not jealous of you. He's jealous of anything he created that he demands the right for worship to come back to him. And he should, share his, he should share his glory with no man or no thing. He should get all the praise and honor and glory for anything that's good in your life. Anything that he has gifted you with, you should give gratitude and thanks to him. It's pretty clear. Pretty good. You don't say, well, I want to thank the Lord God, but if it wasn't for my dad, you know, if he didn't do, but da 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 I would never have been. No, 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 no. If it wasn't for the Lord using my dad, <laughs> if it wasn't for the Lord using my mom, if it wasn't for the Lord using my friend, my sister, my brother, my, my whatever, my child, son, daughter, granddaughter, grandson, whoever it is. The point is you don't put the emphasis, because even though you may say that and don't think much of it, the less you say things the wrong way, the less you'll, tie, you'll fall into that sinful trap of taking pride or not referencing things correctly will then lead your mind to remembering things incorrectly. And we continue to reference things correctly. Thank you, Lord, for your work in so-and-so's life that helped me to be in a better so-and-so place. Then you need to continue to say that because in your mind mentally, you'll remember it correctly, which is how God finds praise and glory through his name because you're remembering that he is the impetus behind every good and gracious thing in your life. Everything comes in and through him in your life, whether it's he uses an animal or a person or a thing or a circumstance or even... God forbid, an illness or a bad situation or abuse. He used anything to bring about blessings in your life. And so it, you got to give thanks and praise to God for that. So here in, in, in Mark, it says that they were lawbreakers. Well, the word for lawbreakers is anomia. So you got lawbreaker is anomia. And nomia means no and I mean, I mean, ah means no, excuse me. And nomia means law. That's no law. Or this can be seen as a rebellious person. Because that's how they see this word being translated, the transgressors, the anomia people. If you're a transgressor, you're an anomia. If you're an anomia transgressor, then you are, in fact, a rebellious person. How can you transgress? How can you be a lawless person unless you are against that which is the law? People misunderstand what this word means. It doesn't mean that you don't have a law. It means that you have a law and you don't abide by any law. You go by your own. That's what he means by lawless. It doesn't mean you're going, I don't know what the business is. No, what you're saying is a lawless person says, I know what it is. I got my own law. I drive when I want, where I want, how I want, to get where I want, when I want, however I want. That's my law. Well, no, no, no. Okay. That's fun. Okay. The law of the land, though, is that little sign called a speed limit sign, and you got to follow it, see? Now, they give you latitude about five, seven miles over, okay? Some people give you 10 miles over. And typically speaking, the cops will start to take it personal, and you go over eight, they start to pull you over, and you take it, right? But we all know this little latitude they give you. But the reality is there's still a law in the books. How they reference it, how they enforce it, yeah, that's a whole different conversation. But there is, in fact, a law in the books. So if you are a lawless person, it doesn't mean you don't have a law. Live in this country, we have laws, right? 
It doesn't mean that you're lawless because you don't have laws. It means that you're lawless because you don't obey or, 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 or value any of those laws. You don't subject yourself to any of them or very few. So a lawless person or anomia is a rebellious person, transgressor. In order to be this type of person described like that, you must have the law of Moses. So these people are Jews. And you go, what? Well, yeah. You said, what's the big deal? I thought only Romans were killed like that, and Jesus was the, was the rare Jewish person killed like this. No, man. There was Jews all out throughout Rome. Come on, now. The Roman Empire, I should say. And that's all throughout the Roman Empire. And there was dominantly, of course, in Jerusalem and Israel. They were there. So, of course, that there was constantly uprisings. And remember the zealots? Remember, they didn't, Judas was influenced by that mindset. It isn't easy when you have a domineering, dominating, exploitative people over you that have the right and authority and power to do what they want. Eventually, it's going to get to you, and you may act out. And so, therefore, you don't care about their laws. I'm defending those who are lawless. To say, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. You justify your so-called acts of God by, by doing things blatantly against the government that gets you killed. Leave your wife and kids, you know, fatherless and, 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 and widowed. Not good. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Victor said, can we all fall in and out of this condition or state? Yes. Yeah. She, she just froze up again. You mean we froze? No, she did. Oh, sorry. And Lainey said, is that why the words are different on the Greek side between Matthew and Mark? Well, Mark is giving you a specific uh, fulfillment. Uh, he's numbered with the lawbreakers, whereas Matthew didn't go into the prophetic fulfillment. That's the reason. So Ma it's just a different reference, remember? Is Matthew. Is robber? Yeah, robber, robber is because Matthew's whole emphasis is on the king. He's, he's, he's emphasizing the kingship of Jesus. So he's emphasizing the kingship of Jesus when he mentions the robbers. He mentions just who they are, not how they steal, the, but who they are as a person defined in their social structure, they're, they're thieves, they're robbers. In the social structure, he's contrasting all of us who rob and steal from God to God himself, right? He wants us to see that we're the servant to the master. We're the subordinate to the power almighty God. So that's why I believe Matthew just points out the robber versus God himself and Christ. Whereas Mark goes into fulfillment of scripture because that makes sense because Mark wants to show Jesus constantly as a servant. And what better way to show a servant mentality than to serve that which you would think you probably wouldn't do that if you were God. Why would you give a loving, kind gesture or why would you orchestrate a death of yourself surrounded by yahoos who could care less about the law that you just fulfilled and you're still fulfilling? They could care less. And you're surrounding yourself by those people on your last moments on this earth. So he's trying to show his servitude to sinners. Even though we're disgusting and disgraceful, he's saying, I surround myself with you to show you I'm reaching out to that length and depth of your sin. I'm like, that's pretty amazing to me. Even in our rebellion, he says, I'm surrounding myself with you for the moment of restoration, which is fantastic to me. Thank God that he is like that, right? So with that being said, that's your law breaker. So and to Vicky's question, yes, we can go in and out of that state. Absolutely you can. You can go in and out of that state. You saw Peter, for example, as an apostle say that, not I, Lord, I would never, you know, be the one who would betray you, and yet he did. But he said that because he was always the one beforehand who seemed to be ready to go, quick to speak. He was the face and voice of Christianity, for crying out loud, and the book of Acts for a good 12 years. And yet, earlier at the cross, he was the one who betrayed our Lord three times. Now, he didn't hand him over like Judas did, but Judas was possessed by Satan. Judas could argue, hey, Peter, you weren't possessed by Satan. He just sifted you like wheat. He came into me, Jack. And Peter might say, well, yeah, but you actually sold Jesus out trying to twist his hand. True, but you were the one who was arrogant enough to say you would never do anything wrong. I never said that. I never said I wouldn't do it. I knew I was going to do it. 
you're the one who said you didn't even, you weren't even true to yourself. At least I was true to myself. I knew I wanted to force his hand. So there could be there could be a conversation there, I'm sure, going on that one could say from both sides of that fence. But the point of it being, it doesn't matter who you are. As an apostle, you can bastardize Judas or praise Peter. The point is, we're in all those guys. And because they experienced the in and outs of being obedient, disobedient, being faithful and being rebellious to God, yeah, I think we do too, absolutely. The question is not, can we do that? The real question is, how do we, pre- how do we limit and prevent the highs and lows of that and the frequency of it? That's the issue. How do I minimize the amount, the, the, the frequency of it, and how do I also minimize the depths from which I go into that despair? If I'm going to be a sinner, which I am, I want to limit how many times I get, in, I, get, I get entrenched in sin in an anomia state of rebellion, and I want to make sure I limit how far down the rabbit hole I go. So that's what the heart of David was about, remember? To catch yourself on your sin quickly and to be, to be repentant and restored to God quickly. And before that, the reason you, 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 reason you could do that is because you, God calls sin what it is, which means you quickly stop yourself. So you don't have the highs and lows, nor do you have the frequency of it because you call it what it is. But you're still a sinner, so it's going to get the better of you at so many different times. The point is, it should come at you, and you, it should get the better of you less and less. And again, it shouldn't hit you as hard at that deepened level. So I hope that answers that question. But these people here... These robbers he's talking about, these lawbreakers, are known now as anomia. And as anomia, anomia people, these people we know go to Gehenna. So answering Todd's question, where is his spirit and soul today? I haven't got there yet. What's going to happen to him now? He's going to go to Gehenna in the future. Because that's where anomia, rebellious people go. That's where lawbreakers go. That's where folks who have the law and didn't obey it, go. And they did have the law, didn't obey it. That's why he says lawbreakers. You don't call a Gentile, apart from being a proselyte, a lawbreaker. The only way a Gentile is called a lawbreaker is if he's a proselyte. You can't be a lawbreaker if you're not a, if you're not a, a Jew or a proselyte Gentile. Okay? That's, that's who is an anomia. Now, and you can see that throughout the entire New Testament, the way he uses that phrasing. You can always see that. All right? Because the nomia, or the nomia, is the Torah. Okay, and that's how you know that it's referencing that aspect what I just said. So then you go over into now in, in Mark also, in verse 32. In verse 32, in Mark 15, he says, The Messiah, the King of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe even those who were crucified with him reproached him. And that word reproach, again, is the same word here, which is to revile him. So Matthew tells you that they reproached and reviled him, but then Mark adds one more piece to it and says, well, okay, they were robbers, but then Luke tells you they, that they were constituted because they're robbers as anomia people. They were constituted as not robbers because of they were in a bad situation and they needed some necessity, like back in the French days, where they, by, by the way, that phrase came from, as in the cake, when Marie Antoinette was a, was a self-absorbed jerk and people were starving in the streets and so they broke windows to get food, for crying out loud, bread to live because they were starving the people. So they go, cut crash, and they take the bread, you know, and you're a thief. You're like, because I'm hungry, man. I'm hungry. You're starving me to death. You can't put bread through a window in front of me when you're not feeding me because you're a jerk of a government taking my food off my table for my family. That's a different kind of thief. It's different. He makes it clear that, no, these are, these are outright rebellious lawbreakers. These are outright rebellious lawbreakers. They're rebellious. Okay, these people that he's numbered with. So Matthew says they're robbers, and Matthew uh, talks about them being crucified with him, reviling him, and then Mark says the same thing, but he adds one thing different. He says they're anomia. Then you go to Luke. Luke chapter 22, 23, excuse me. I almost said the wrong piece. Luke 23. Luke 23, and he says in verse 32 to 43, I'm not going to read all of this, but highlights are num- verse 32. Now two others who were criminals were also led with him to be put to death. All right. Then he goes into 
verse 33, and they came to the place which they call the skull. They were nailed, where they nailed them to the cross. And the criminals, and they're called criminals, in the left side of your margin, it says malefactors. So now the robber is the type of criminal they are. So now Luke gives them a more, even more general term. He says criminal. So they're criminals who are robbers who reviled him. But Mark says, to be specific, criminals who are robbers who are unknown. The reason they're criminals that are robbers is because their, their core issue is their anomia. They're rebellious. And because you're rebellious, you become a criminal. And because you become a criminal, you choose what kind of criminal you want to be. They're going to be their robbers, their thieves. Okay? So with this being said, he goes in and says one was at his right hand, one was at his left in verse 33 of Luke 23. And then later on, he says over into verse 39 is where it gets interesting through verse 41. In verse 39 of Luke 23, he says, And one of the criminals who was suspended reviled him, saying, Art thou the Messiah? Save thyself and us. And the word suspended does mean to hang there, which leads some people to believe maybe they weren't nailed to the cross. Maybe they were just roped up there which did happen in some cases, and they would stone you to death or other things. But they think this, this phrasing makes that possible in this case. But I don't think that personally. I believe that just describes that they were hanging by nothing but the nails on the cross because it says crucified with him, right? You can't be crucified with him if you're not nailed to a cross, my friend. That's what crucifixion means, not roped up there, nailed to it, okay? Verse 40, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not even fear God, since thou art under the same sentence? Interesting, because Matthew and Mark said the robbers reproached and reviled. But then Luke says, one, it says there was one on his left, one on his right, back in verse 33, but then in verse 40, it says, and the other, and look at the word other, in verse 40, left side of your margin, in Luke 23, and it says, answering the heterox. That means different from. Different from. And because, you, and because Luke uses the word criminals, I, I'm going to put something out there. I, <laughs> there could be a fourth person here. So, because here's why I'm saying that because that's the person you're talking about, Todd, the thief on the cross, that becomes the issue, right? You're talking about Luke itself is where your question lies. Because this guy says, when everybody says the thief on the cross, they mean the guy. They don't mean the guys who reviled him and said, yo, you're supposed to be the son of God, do something, man. No, not, not those guys, not those yahoos. When you say the thief, you mean the guy that says, no, y'all need to stop. We all deserve to be here. But not this man. Not him. And then he says, remember me. You come into your kingdom. Right? So in verse 40, that's my paraphrase. In verse 40, the scripture says it this way. In verse, well, first, verse 39, first the, the one criminal reviles him and says, aren't, thou you Messi aren't, there, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Verse 40, but the other, the heterox, answering the other what? The heterox, the different from him criminal, which means Luke says he's a criminal. But he was a heterox, which means he was different from. He was different from. Now, money would argue, does it mean different from as in he wasn't a hard-hearted robber? He was a penitent robber? Or does it mean he's a different kind of criminal? I would contend that if he was trying to tell us he's a different kind of robber, why didn't Matthew and Mark make that delineation? Why didn't Matthew and Mark say they both reviled him? What, why is that? Whereas in Luke, it says that, this, that he calls them criminals, and then he says that there's a heterox one different from the other in verse 40. He says, rebukes him, which means he hushes him up and says, basically, don't, don't say that. Do you have no fear of God? Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence? Verse 41, and we indeed, we indeed justly, for we, for, 
for we receive what is due for the deeds we have done? He's admitting he's a criminal. But this man has done nothing amiss, which means nothing atopos, nothing that's uh, wrong, nothing out of place, nothing directly, nothing indirectly, nothing that could be circumstantially seen as wrong. That, that word atopos means ah, uh, nothing, topos, place. There is nothing out of place in this guy's life. There's no narrative that the political genre of the media today could dig up on Jesus and vet out and somehow twist it. You, you do what you want. You can always lie about somebody, but there's no substance. There's nothing there that you could ever take anything and use against him. There's nothing out of place. You can vet him all you want, Jack. There's nothing there. You can have fodder to make up a lie that he's some unworthy person. It's not going to happen. He's a sinless humanity representation of God in the flesh who lived and came down to show us the way. Because he is the way, the truth, the life. He's God Almighty. So he says he's nothing to miss. By him saying that, he is saying he is the Messiah. He admits he's a sinner. He defends the Lord's honor, admits he's a sinner, and then he, and he declares his deity by saying he's done nothing amiss. Then he shows his submission to the king by saying, and he said in verse 42, and he said to Jesus, Yeshua, remember me when thou come, comest into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Indeed, I say to you, this day you shall be with me in paradise. So I would contend to you that there's, <laughs> there's potentially a fourth person here. Because Luke mentions criminals, Matthew and Mark does not. Luke mentions criminals, and then he mentions a heterodox criminal. Coincidentally, that all of a sudden now speaks kindly to, to Jesus. Even before he does, he rebukes the one who spoke wrong. So it's almost as if there was two robbers. One was speaking, they, they both reviled him, but one actually was coming at him, specific, probably more of, a, more of the leader of the pack of the two. He was coming at him. And, and this other guy says, stop doing that. And he, we see him in Luke. So I don't know who this is, but I know he's a criminal. I know that because he's, he's just a heterodox criminal. Now, there's two kinds of, again, definitions you could get into heterodox criminal. Either he's a heterodox criminal, meaning he's not a robber, or he's a heterodox criminal because he's a robber who has become penitent versus a robber who's become who's still hard-hearted. That's up for debate. That's fine. But then you have to answer the question, what does it mean in Matthew and Mark when he says that they reviled him? The robbers both rebuked him. They both insulted him. But over here in Luke, it doesn't say that he did that, did it? But in Matthew and Mark, it makes it clear the robbers did that. The robbers did that. So did this guy do that? It didn't look like it, which means maybe he's not a robber. Maybe he's a criminal, but a different type of criminal. That's what I'm more leading to believe in my own mind, but I still don't know, to be clear for you and be honest, I can't sit here and tell you, oh, the, this is where he was at. I'm not saying that he walked down. It says that two other criminals with him were, were walking on the way of the crucifixion and other passages. It doesn't mean that he was there. I don't know all the pieces, parts, how it plays out. I just know that when they're up, up there, it seems like there was four crosses up there. It's very common, as we already know, we already know the common tradition is there's three. There's Jesus and two other guys. So it isn't far-fetched to had one more. Because this is where Chitwood himself would, would have this belief back in the day. He would say that because of this type of thing. So you just, you just, but the Lord leaves out so much other information to kind of help you to see if that's true, then how does he fit in? Where does he, where does he come into the whole story? I don't know. I don't know. But I do think it's interesting to see that problem. Now, the question would be spiritually, why would God do that? I think God's trying to show of the foolish virgins, a minority is redeemed from the majority. So out of three, one. That's the minority number out of three, right? There's no other number you could use out of three when you're talking about people to show a minority. You can only use one, right? It also shows, uh, again, the, the oneness of God's spirit to continue to restore and, and cleave to all of his children to some degree, they are still going to have a redemption. It's only going to be, unfortunately, much delayed later for those people. 
So who's thief on the cross? And you say, what is the spirit and soul today? People who are spirit and soul today, everybody is, is in the heavenlies, either uh, walking freely with the saints or they're in the holding place. The thief who spoke well of Christ is in the freedom place seeking his will from the saints. Here am I. So Todd said, missed everything you said. Missed everything I said about what, babe? Well, like, uh, I don't know. Well, when did he, <laughs> when did he say? Because he broke down one of the types. What's that? He broke down a type, but he said the last 15 seconds. Oh, 15 seconds, okay. Pam said, wait there on the cross. It was all along the roadway to display all of the criminals being killed for the gain of the populace. Absolutely. So there could have been somebody already there who was earlier crucified, and, and that could be they joined him later because that was the spectacle at the time in the city. Very common practice. So that could be easily the case. So, right. yeah, absolutely. So, but I can't definitively say that other than putting together pieces from the Bible to the historical, and then, you know, you got to kind of, but there's nothing definitive in the scripture itself. So I'm always open to, to tell you that. What I was saying before, though, when I got my mic went, went dead, I apologize for the battery going dead. We're talking about how the, the, the thief on the cross issue is, so you, you, have, you have people on the cross that, again, there's robbers there that we know for certain Matthew and Mark des describes these criminals as robbers, but Luke just calls them a criminal. And he says it's a heterox criminal that says basically to the other man, don't do that, and he defends him, meaning Christ, and admits he's a sinner and de you know, basically declares his deity by saying he's done nothing amiss, nothing out of place, and then says, remember me, come into the kingdom. So he's basically showing a submission to a subordinate role. So the thief on the cross who was the one who lauded Jesus, that's the one who will be in the free place in heaven where he's roaming freely to talk with the, with the camp of the saints of the Old Testament folks, the apostles. They're, they're having a lot of koinonia fellowship, tight-knit fellowship, and they're fellowshipping. Well, there's the place where you have the have-nots, which is the place that's the holding place in heaven where captivity is held captive. That was brought out of Hades already because it's empty down in Hades. There's nobody there, right? So right now, the spirit and soul of anybody who was like that thief who was living in an obedient state, whether it was at the last ditched effort or through all of life, you're all at, at the current time of right now in heaven, they're in the, the have section. They're in the obedience section because they made right with God. He's not deliberating their just rewards yet about, oh, you just had your last bit of your life that way, whereas Moses, let's face it, he's you know, had a long life, but he had this one thing he has to correct and come back versus Paul and the rest of them. There's all these people up there that are, you know, have their up and comings of the different ways in which the rewards and the placements of the merit of their deeds, as Jesus said, will be fleshed out. But in a general sense, there's those who are in the obedient circle and those in the disobedient circle, okay? And those in the obedient circle are the ones he gives gifts to men. And those gifts are the freedom they have now to, to fellowship and enjoy uh, the pl pleasantries of that piece of heaven, not his throne room, but that piece of heaven he calls paradise. And then there's the captivity held captive where he stays the execution of judgment unto the son himself who will not execute judgment until he comes back. And so they know they're the have-nots, but they're on the outside looking in. And that's where the other thieves are at, which are the robbers who are rebellious, who are destined for Gehenna. But in the meantime, that's where they are. So again, today where are they at is not the same as what they will be later on. But I want to make sure we went through the scriptures. So Todd, that's a, that's a long answer. That was a very involved question, probably more than you realize, more than I thought it was going to be. But I had to go through that. So did I answer your question satisfactorily, yes or no? Yeah, the, the, the one, no, not the, not the bad one, not the bad one, the good one. The good, the good, the criminal who spoke good about Jesus is in the free space, yes. Speaking of right. Correct. So I'd say you answered it based on your assumption of a third person? I answered it, no. 
I answered it based on ba no. I answered it based upon the fact that whether he's a, whether he's a fourth person or not on in the cross. So if it, whether he's a third criminal or not is not really to me um, relative to the final result of the answer. The answer is still the answer of who he is. The question is, is he a penitent robber who became this way, or was he a different person? That does not change the fact. He still, once you get past that definition of how he got to where, he, where he's at, the starting point, if you will, the ending point's still the same. The definition of who he is is still the same as far as in his character. How he got there is the question. Was he a criminal who was not a robber, like I mentioned, or is he a robber with a different heart, a penitent heart? I don't know that for definitive purposes, but I will say to you that either way, it does not change my answer. The answer is still the same of the thief on the cross. Does that make sense? Because the, the, how he got to where he's at is not the point um, for me to answer the question differently. You did this thing again where well, it fades out. What are you talking about? Keep talking. I think you hit When did it do that? Just the other time. Okay, so this is all about technology syncing right now is what this is. It's so ignorant. This, this is so dumb. It should never happen. This should never, ever happen. That was the mega meeting timing out again because it's ignorant. Okay, that's what that was. That was mega meeting timing out in a big way, as you can see. My apologies. That's what that was, and I'm sorry. So that's what this is. So that's why we got the YouTube for, so you can go back on YouTube or on the website. That's what we got it for. So, so that's what that is. So people watching us on YouTube are probably going, what's this, you know? So when this happens, that's why we have that, thank God, but it's just a pain. I do apologize. So again, um, what's, what I was saying to you is, is that, to Brother Todd's question, did I answer the question assuming he's a third person? No. I answered the question on the basis of whether he is a third person or whether he is a penitent robber is not my emphasis at all. The emphasis is I wanted to bring out he could be either one. Irrespective to that, the truth is still the truth is still the truth and it's where his spirit and soul is and where he will end up in the next life. Okay? That's what I'm saying. So I'm just bringing forth to you the idea that he could be one of two identities of people. But who he is in his character and his moral fiber of what was exposed to us is still the same. All right? So that's, now did, did I answer your question Satisfactorily, Brother Todd, yes or no? Please answer the question to Jesus saying, Today you will be with me in paradise. It is only based on that in the moment we were saved. He went into paradise because Jesus went down into the pleasant part of Hades. Remember, paradise was the Abraham's bosom. So what was in paradise was a, for, was a foreshadow of what would be in heaven because he took paradise to heaven. Paradise represents the place of the obedient ones and where they would have their abode until judgment would come. So when he says you'll be with me in paradise, he means you won't go to the fiery side of Hades underneath. You will be at the, fiery si you'll be at the paradise place above because you ended your life with an obedience of acknowledgement, of humbleness of contriteness, of worshiping me, of declaring who I am in your life. 
And so because of that, to be with me in paradise, which is the Abraham's bosom, the obedient side of Hades, which he will then take to heaven, which he already did back in, back in the day. Enter a breeze. So is now the, <laughs> did I answer your question satisfactorily, yes or no? Keep pausing, so obviously there's something else I'm missing, obviously. <laughs> he said, will he, after the Bema Seat, and then go to Gehenna for a thousand years? Yes. Yes. Well, well, no, no, wait, wait a minute. Oh, yes. Okay, you're talking, okay, wait a minute. Okay. So the thief on the, okay, you're talking about the thief who did the good thing. Okay, it's the thief who is, who is doing the good thing. We didn't get in that. So these two guys, the, the robbers who reproached him, they go to Gehenna. We know that for a fact. The thief who repented and made right with God, no, he does not go to Gehenna. No. No. So whether or not you think there's a third person or you think the robber, one of the robbers became penitent, either way, that person, because of his, his heart of acknowledgement and of penitence and of acknowledgement and embracing of Christ, he does not go to Gehenna. That's a state... So in Luke, the thief on the cross then, if you think he's the same one in Luke who's a different person, I'm just going to do it. He is, he is like an earthy one. He enters day seven, but he's disinherited. He has no, he has no fruits. He has no fruits of, of to, to have produced. So he is going to enter as an earthy one in day seven, but he'll be disinherited. But he will enter. He will not be in Gehenna. He will not be in Hades. That that guy. I want to make sure I didn't, sorry for, miss, I didn't want to misstate that. The ones who go to Gehenna and Hades are the ones who did the reviling, the, the, the onomia people. The one, again, this is where you get, it's, it's convoluted. So whether you think there's two that did that or, or they, and, then, and then one repented, or there's two that did that, and there's another guy who was like, that, that, that's, that's why to me it's a lot easier to think personally. I think there was two that were robbers, and there is one guy, yes. But if you think there was two robbers and one became penitent, whatever, then the one who became penitent there, therefore becomes an earthy one because he's no longer in a rebellious state when he died. And Jesus made that clear when he said, you be with me in paradise, which is a validation of the statement of fact that he's not going to be judged for his sins in the way in which he would have been if he had not done what he did on the statements and acclamation to Christ. Does that make sense? I'm not sure if I'm helping you, but so did I answer your question? That is correct. That is correct. Yep. But since it's Brother Todd's question, he has to be the one that signs off. We can't, <laughs> you got to sign off and tell me that I answered your question, yes or no. I can't. He said, yes, I am confused, I guess, on my doctrine I've learned over the last 12 years. Oh. Okay. All right, well, we can always, if everything else, you know, whatever you want to, if anything else comes up that I can use to clarify, just let me know. I'm just, but I want, I'll say it another, another way differently. Lastly, then we'll go to the next question you have. But the difference is that, again, a person can, a, a person can live with total disregard to God, total disregard. But if after, before they die, if they say, Lord, I am a, I'm a penitent, I'm a sinful person. I'm a rebellious person. I am a unreconciled person. Whatever they want to say that comes from their truth of their heart and their soul and their spirit about them being true to themselves as being sinful, a disobedient child to God, and they just throw themselves at the mercy of the court. And then, oh, 
and they die. Well, that person who lives like ill repute can't possibly have an inheritance. But they also died in a good state. So they can't possibly be judged the same way for all of their sins because the Lord makes it clear in 1 John 1, 9, He forgives you of all your sins. Washes them all away. And that's the reason why 1 Corinthians 15 exists, to, under, to, mis, to, to, to take away the misunderstandings of the churchianity movement that says we're all communistic, we're all the same. No, 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 no. 1 Corinthians 15 says we have, a, we have an order of things. There's a togma, an order, a rank and file. And it goes through different bodies. And one of those is an earthy one. That's a body, that's a bare grain, as he calls it. So there's nothing there, but you still have a body that you can actually walk on the earth with to say, I've entered the blessings of God. That's better than the alternative of understanding the chastisements of God in the place of fiery correction or sanctification or reconciliation. No thank you on that. He learned that lesson by doing the last thing of his life, by confessing with penitence. He avoided all of that. How awesome is that? Within five minutes, you can erase a thousand years of a future hell, on, hell underneath the earth in Hades or Gehenna. That's how awesome our God is. God wasn't joking when he said in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, I'll forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Uh, no, no, no joke, man. Like, hallelujah. I mean, that's a big deal. That is massive deal. God takes a giant etch-a-sketch on all of our sins and just goes, shh. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's the reason why thief on the cross who said what he said can be like, that doesn't matter anymore. You're a different dude. However, you ain't got nothing to show, so you're an earthy one. You're going to enter, you just can't inherit. So there's inheritor, there's enterer, then there's the disobedient one. The chief place you want to be is the inheritor, no doubt, right? But ideally, you want to be the enterer in the heavens who later on becomes the inheritor. The only time entering is better than inheriting is when you're entering the heavens. So you want to enter the heavens, ideally, inherit the earth, second place, enter the earth, third place, or get fourth place, you're off the podium. You're, you're, you're in the fiery place being dealt with severely, not pleasant. Yes? They said he can in um, truth in day seven. Yes. They live in outer darkness. What is outer darkness for the Jews only? No, he can do, he, go ahead. No problem. And lady said he had no fruit. Yep. But yeah, he can earn more fruit in day seven, and he can therefore ascend up the spiritual rung into an inheritance. That's what the, that's what the great white throne's about, the end of, day, end of day seven, to distinguish who he who has done that to move up. Uh, or he could be cast out to the other side and um, have his uh, portion in the lake of fire. Or like you mentioned before, uh, the Jews uh, in the outer darkness are not the only ones. There's two groups of people in outer darkness. It's the Jews from day seven, and it's the people from the heavenlies who are cast out as in the foolish virgins. So you are semi-correct. So in outer darkness, there's two kinds of people. There's the people from the heavenly that are cast out, and there's the Jews on earth who didn't make it in. But nobody on the earth who was here goes to outer darkness because they either A, go to the portion of the lake of fire for day eight, or they be ascend up to an airship level on the earth. But they don't go to outer darkness. If they were already here, they, they got to go up or they go down. They don't, they don't stay the same. Yes? God said, so how did the fruitless person not get caught in Gehenna? A, pr a, person, who has, a person who's in Gehenna, one of these robber people, um, they are to be, they're in Gehenna to be first and, on first and foremost under the type of Jonah. They're supposed to learn the subjection to God's tough love. And they have to receive and believe, if you will. They have to receive that truth and believe that truth in their heart, mind, and spirit that this, in fact, they brought on, on themselves. And this, in fact, is a loving chastisement of God. That's a hard sale 
when you're going through pain and anguish. That God loves you and he's doing it for good for you. And if you think that's easy to, 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 to do, just ask Job, who's the best of us, who couldn't pull it off past eight days. He fell apart like a cookie crumbling in your hand. So that's the passage for people in Ghana to bear forth fruit. They have to first and foremost receive that this is their undoing. And they have to believe this is God's love through tough circumstances of pain and anguish that he must scourge and purge out of them this sin to help them to be better. And when they have that penitent mindset, then they'll be ascended to the earth to which at certain moments, like Jonah was, be restored to an earth to then do the things to produce the fruit because now they're around the people that are sowing that fruit. Yes? Okay, outer darkness is in day eight. Outer darkness is always day eight, day eight, day eight, day eight. It's only day eight. So never put outer darkness in day seven. It's only day eight. So now, Brother Todd's point about if he's a robber, again, remember, this is where you're getting confused. That's why I prefer to think of the thief on the cross as a third person. Okay, I'm gonna define him two different ways. If he's a third person, that he's the criminal who is not a robber. So it doesn't matter about that robber thing. It doesn't matter. If he's a third person, he's not a robber because you have to go with the idea he's a heterodox criminal, that means he's not a robber. But if you go, no, I want the traditional mindset of two dudes and that's it and Jesus. Okay, fine, 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 fine. fine. I don't care whatever you want. Okay, you want that one? Fine. Okay, so they're both robbers, right? Well, then that means one of them had to be penitent. Had to be, because Luke said, the dude comes out and says, don't say that, after they both were reviling him. So I don't care what you want to start with. I really don't care. All I can tell you is this. If he was a robber, and then he becomes penitent, and, he, and he, he's a different kind of robber, guess what? He's not seen as a robber no more, because he's telling God, I suck. I'm a bad human, and I want to be with you. And he's like, you know what? That's a good thing to be with me. So he's, 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 he's left that life in the past. It's gone. Yeah. And he said, please don't. There are two people. Correct. One is penitent. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can do this. I mean, I'm saying. I mean, there is a, you could do that. I'm just saying. But, but if you have a penitent person, it's, 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 all I'm saying is it's hard. There's an argument to be made. That it's, that it's hard to go from, because remember, it isn't like they're on the cross for a very, very long, long, long time. You're talking a couple hours, okay? You're talking 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., six hours, right? So you're talking six hours, and you're talking about a guy going, spewing hatred at Jesus to then converting to being nice. Is it possible? Absolutely. But, but I'm just, it, it's, it's, it would be something that would be, for me, you would think that would be stated more clearly. That's the argument on the other side. You would think that would be stated more clearly. You would think if that's what happened, which had to have happened, and there's only two, right? You would, why didn't you state that more clearly? Why didn't you say, and the penitent one said, oh, well, the one who had a change of heart said, why wouldn't you, or the one who previously reviled him said, I don't under, how could you go from such hatred within six hours to, and my, by the way, you're in extreme pain, right? You're getting, you're getting the same pains of crucifixion like Jesus is having. The suffocation process, the whole aches and pains, all that stuff, it's, it's crazy. So it's just, a, it's just, I'm not saying there's a third person. I'm saying there's a valid argument for that because there's enough evidence that could say, you know what, it, it leaves it open for that to be an acceptable understanding because you can't prove or disprove that there's not. You can't prove or disprove there's not. I'm just telling you, you, you to me, you can't. It's a matter of you have to believe either he was penitent, and if you believe that, then you can say the word heterox means a different kind of robber, but if you believe heterox means a different kind of criminal, there's evidence on both sides there because then I would say if he's only two, then why would Luke say criminal 
to, to differentiate the word heterox there. I mean, I just think it's interesting. Yes. He said, I think you are in the point one, uh, point zero, 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 one percent. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm just letting you know that I think, I, mean, I, I may be, but I think it's just interesting how I think there's, as a teacher of the Bible, my job is not to sit here and tell you my belief system. My job is to tell you what's there. And I'm telling you what's there is, is a, is you, have to ha you, ha you have to acknowledge. If there's two people and someone says to you, hey, Matthew and Mark said they both reviled him. If Luke is trying to tell me that one of those guys changed his mind, why is it not recorded? And your answer is what? Why is it not recorded? That's kind of a big deal. I'm, I'm just saying. Just saying. Why is it not recorded? And you say, because God didn't want it there. Why? Why? Okay, I digress. How about this question? How about, there's only two people, right? But how come in Luke, the word heterox is used to reference the different kind of criminal he is, and that's the only time that we find this different character of person? And given the timeline of Luke, it wasn't six hours. This happened in three hours. So within three hour span, you go from hateful to awesome? I, I don't know, man. It's just a hard thing. <laughs> it's a hard thing to, 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 to really kind of grasp. Like you're saying, wow, that's, that's, that timeline was really quick. Because think about this. I'll read it to you again. When he says, uh, how, uh, can't you say if you, in verse, uh, let me see here, in verse 36 of Luke 23, they came and offered him vinegar, right? So go back to uh, Mark. Go back to Mark in 15. Let me show you. In Mark 15, when he says, oh, hello. In Mark 15, going back to, um, oh, that's the, I'll look at the vinegar, it was the part where they, in verse 32 when he says, the Messiah, the King of Israel, let him come down from the cross that we may see and believe, even those who crucified him reproached him. So they are deriding him in verse 31, the scribes and the Pharisees are by saying, he saved others, can he save himself? And then there's them saying, and even those who were crucified with him reproached him. Plural. Okay. And then you go over to Luke. So in that same context, you're going to tell me within a matter of seconds, this guy goes from speaking hatred to all of a sudden being cool. Because that's what you want to, you have to believe that. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying you got to be able to answer that question from the person who says, hey, man, if the dude changed his mind, you're saying that this guy says in verse 39, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. It sounds like the context is from what, Matt, what Mark 15 was saying. Well, wait a second. That was the same time that they, who were both being crucified, were saying to him, punk, they were speaking nasty stuff to Jesus. Wait a second. How did the dude within seconds go from being hateful to being cool? Within minutes. I was giving you last week before saying hours, but I'm just telling you, man, there is more there than you realize, and you just take tradition and say, flush. I don't care about tradition. I could care less. I care about how this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. You can't over here say, I hate you. You are the devil. Save yourself. And then within minutes later go, oh, Lord, tell your friend, shut up. Lord, remember me. What? You were just telling me I suck a second ago. You were telling me that I should do something to save myself. And now all of a sudden you believe I'm the guy? Just like that? Huh? It said in Mark 15 that those crucified with him were reproaching him. When they were saying, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. And then in Luke, the guy who corrects the other robber, the other criminal, excuse me, says, to the robber who says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. And he corrects them. I'm, I, it's, <laughs> I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying there's an argument there that the other side has validity. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. 
whether it's one percent or not, still, you know, yeah. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jim said, I think God changed his heart. It was for the benefit of all of us to see the heart of God. No, I get it too. His willingness to bless and forgive even at the last possible moment on earth. God said, so because the guy who got to go to paradise doesn't have to go to Gehenna because at the last second he acknowledged Jesus as God, but if you acknowledge Jesus after living a filthy life one day before you die and continue sinning, then you spend time in Gehenna? When he said, Greek says in Mark, having been crucified, translate. Yeah, so, so the reality is that your point is a good one about it all, matter, it all matters when you sin. You're right. It all matters when you sin. Bottom line. You have to be faithful unto death. It's like the inverse return on financial matters. It's like the inverse return on spiritual value. You can't start great and then the last moments of your life get something bad happen and then go downhill and go, Whoa, whoa, but I had 40 years of awesomeness. Just the last five years I was sucking it up. And God's going to go, it does, then you, how did you die? Rebellious or faithful? Well, rebellious. Then that's who you are. But Lord, da, 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 da. how did you die? That's who you are. Now, the scary part is your level of consequence and or benefit is based upon what you were called to be. So if I am called to be a higher responsibility, then I fall down later on. Well, how I end up is how I end up. That's how I'm going to be dealt with. But the level of how I'm culpable is based upon what I was called to be. So the level of my consequence or, or benefits are based upon the level of where I was supposed to be at. But how I'm dealt with is based upon whether I'm being obedient, disobedient, is how I die. Did I die in obedience or disobedience? That's what dictates what I have to experience. The level of which I have to do that, that's a whole different filter. But the fact of the matter is you're right. It sounds crazy. You can live all this great life or live this horrible, 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 evil life. And at the end, just say, you know, I'm sorry about that. Like they said Ted Bundy did, by the way. Wait, right? I think it was uh, Dobson said he met with him in the prison in Florida and that Dobson said that Ted Bundy gave his life to Christ. Do you believe Ted James Dobson? I do. I'm not, he has no reason to lie about that. He said that's what happened. So how do you deal with that as a family who he murdered your daughter? How do you deal with that? I mean, it's not, <laughs> hey man, my brother who went to college knew the guy. He's dead right now. How do I deal with that? And I could say he's associated with some of the things that happened to my brother. There's all kinds of things you can get involved in human emotion and the anger and the, and the not fair stuff, but the point is simply God's point is not about making it fair to you or fair to me. He could care less how you feel or how I feel about what's right and wrong. He doesn't care about that. All he cares about is it's real simple. The rules are the rules. And if you have a chance to say you forgive and you get right with God, then God could treat you differently. Even though you were a heinous, evil, wicked human being, you get treated differently. You, you don't go. You don't go. You, you don't. You get treated differently because you died in a different state. You get. You get seen to be someone who could enter, but you have nothing there. Yes. Vicky said it all matters when you repent and believe in Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Clean slate. Yeah. I guess so it's how will these people be taught the scriptures or knowledge of Jesus without spending time in Gehenna? Again, when you're on the earth as an earthy one, the, the gospel message of the kingdom of the heavens is being spread throughout, which includes the fullness of the counsel of God. And, and it says clearly in the scripture, there's going to be no need to have uh, people misunderstand. It's going to be clearly known who he is and what the word of God has to say. So you're on the earth as an earthy one. You're learning quite a bit. You're learning a ton. And you're also learning the, 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 the recourse. If you, if you fall into sin, then, you know, you, 
you could be confined to that place. Just because you start off as an earthworm doesn't mean you're going to stay there. Remember that. doesn't mean you stay there. If you get in by the skin of your chinny chin chin and you act like you're just a belligerent, arrogant fool later on, well, then you're going to get cast down during day seven. You'll get cast down there during. It works both ways. You can be restored or you can be cast down there as an earthy one. That's not funny. He ain't playing with you. He will strike you where you stand, and you'll, you'll, you can go down there. So th it, there's no such thing as a free pass, if you will. These people don't have a free pass. It's like they go, ah, ha, ha, you're in Gehenna, and I'm not, ha, ha, ha. No, 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 no. They can't tell their fellow criminal buddy, hey, my last breath, I ended right. You didn't. Two, tough nuts for you, buddy. You're in Gehenna. I don't think so. Yeah, you got to still live right, brother. When you're on the earth as an earthy one, you better start living right. You just can't be belligerent like that and arrogant and self-absorbed. He'll deal with you harshly. And you too will go down and join your friends. You think it's just funny? It's a game? It's not a game. If you don't live the right way, you will have the consequence on your life. It's that simple. There's no I free pass. I ain't saying terrorism. God just, God just said, look, man, you're going to have the chance to start off differently because you ended differently. That's all. Think of it that way. Because you ended differently, you get to start differently in the next life. It doesn't mean it's a permanent fixture of where you start will always be the way you stay. No. Because you ended right, you start better. So you still have to do better or else you can end up being brought back down. There's no free pass. That's not how it works. So I, I don't know if that helps answer your question. I don't know. I just know that we took two hours just about on the one question. I hopefully I've answered it. I don't know if I did or not. He said yes. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about all that. That's a lot of rabbit trails. Good gracious sakes. All right. So then we got Luke 22, verses 24 to 30. And that's your next question you asked. Luke 22. Luke 22, verses 24 to 30. And he said, and there was also a contention among them, which of them should be the greatest, which should be thought the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the nations or the ethnos, ethno groups exercise dominion over them, and those having authority over them are styled or are called benefactors. But, they, but you must not be so, but the least, or but let the greatest among you, excuse me, become as the least and the governor as he who serves. For he who is greater, he who reclines, or he who serves. Who is greater? It is not he who reclines. Is it not he who reclines? But I am among you as he who serves. And you are they who have continued with me in my trials. And I covenant, or that means appointed. It's a diatethemi. I have appointed, which is through, which is dia, and, and tethemi, my will. So through my will I have appointed for you, even as my father has appointed for me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is no different than what he said in Matthew 19 about the 12 apostles, distinctly them who have a distinction to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So I'm not sure what exactly the question here is per se, but it's not everybody who's judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It's specific to the apostles, which is why there was a conversation. They knew they were distinct. They knew they were unique. They knew they were separate and called out. They were actually called out of the called already. Israel was already called to God. They were called out from that. And those called out from that group of 12 were Peter, James, and John. So there was already three, three callings there. There was the calling of Israel, the called out of the 12, who I actually be technical. There was the general calling of Israel. Then there was the called out of those to be the 70 apostles. Then he called out a unique 12 group different from those apostles to be unique to him. I should say those disciples to be uniquely 12 apostles to him. Then of those, there was those three. So they, they already saw this uniqueness of division that God was doing. So they were trying to figure out how does all this order of things play out in the next life? Yes. Just one second. If you could comment on verse 30. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So when you say eat and drink at my table, so in my kingdom, he is talking about and the fact that in the heavenlies in day eight, 
he's going to have the Israel will be on the earth, and the New Jerusalem will be sitting on the earth, and they will have, you know, the theocracy over all the peoples. And then you're going to have, of course, in the New Jerusalem, you're going to have the marriage feast, uh, the consummation of the bride, is referring to amongst the bride, which we haven't talked about this in a long time. This is that friend, if you will. So the apostles, there are thrones, and the 24 elders are pictured in a, like in a close proximity in God's throne room. So there are the thrones he talks about sitting in, speaks to his throne room and therefore his intimacy of the closeness of a certain groups of people that are with him. Not everybody. That's why you have 24 elders that have this like council amongst his throne room. And you have the four living ones and then the seraphim and then underneath is the cherubim. But you, you have these groups of people. So these 12 tribes that are, are the 12 thrones, excuse me, ruling over the 12 tribes speaks to the day eight period, the period where the apostles will rule over Israel and that they're in their thrones as a, pe as a friend of the bridegroom, not just the bride, but they're even higher than that as a friend of the bridegroom. And they have this hierarchy of, of element that because, again, their names are written on the foundation of because Christ is the foundation and they're the foundation also that the house is built on. Their names are written on the New Jerusalem. It's no surprise they would, dwell, they would judge the 12 tribes. Um, the surprise would be, you know, where they do that. He makes that clear. It's at the table in his kingdom, speaking of the Dipnon marriage feast, that they're in a special place of uniqueness at that table, which is why he talks about reclining and serving and, and so forth. He's talking about in the end state of it all, after they enter and when they inherit, they in turn will then be over uniquely from those who entered and those who inherit they'll be the bride, then from the bride they'll be even those who are the friend of the bridegroom, and that's them. And they, and those there who are of that ilk, the 12 apostles, will rule over the 12 tribes of Israel, which is what he spoke about also in Matthew 19. He said that in a similar fashion as well. Does that make sense? I hope I answered your question. I don't know. Did I answer your question? I'm not sure. Yeah? Yeah? If you go to Matthew 19, you can see the same passage I keep referencing. For example, in Matthew 19, he says, in Matthew 19, he said that, um, and Jesus said to them, Indeed, I say to you that in the palingenesia, which is says renovation, but it's palingenesia, which is a new birth, uh, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, day eight, you, my followers, shall also sit on 12 thrones, including the 12 tribes of Israel. It doesn't mean 12 tribes of Israel. So he tells you that right there. Then you go also, um, if you look over in Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 2, when he said, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if by you the world is judged, are you inadequate to decide trivial cases? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Why not then these things pertaining to this life? But up in verse 2, left side of your margin, first line, uh, epi upon, or uh, by, he says epi, upon, uh, uh, blah, blah. In, it's epi, which is, excuse me, ice is into epi, upon. Upon the saints, ton agion, or not know you that oi, oi, agioi, which oi is always those saints there. So amongst the ton agion, there's those saints there. So he's pointing out within the group of Ton Agion, there's a distinct group of saints. So people always say, we're going to judge the world and judge angels. Not everybody. Amongst a group of already select people, there'll be a group out of that that does the judging. So God's not inconsistent like at all. He's pointing out in Corinthians what he already told you in Matthew and he told you in Luke that of all those who enter the heavens and then therefore inherit as the bride, only the apostles have 12 thrones to sit on. If there was more people to judge Israel, um, where's the other thrones at? Why would it make sense to have more than 12 thrones when there's 12 tribes and God's consistent on 12 being governmental completion? That makes no sense to me. But hey, if you want to believe there's like 85,000 thrones or 85 million, have fun with that. But that's not really in here. So he speaks to the fact that there is a different a distinction issue there of a uniqueness of the apostles, which aligns itself perfectly later on in 1 Corinthians 6 when he says, 
the oi agioi, speaking of those saints amongst the saints who are already uniquely in the heavenlies, these people will then judge. Okay, now, so this right here again speaks to, I'm going to put unique and distinct office of the 12 apostles to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. All right? Oh, in day eight. And you have to go to also Matthew. Nineteen, and I talked about Matthew nineteen, and that was verse twenty-eight, and twenty-seven, and twenty-eight, and then also First Corinthians six, one through four. All right. So, did I answer your question there satisfactorily? You tell me. Yes, babe. Can this uh, make an assumption? I thought the apostles were sitting on the throne in day seven on earth. You're saying this verse does not speak to day seven, but to day eight? Correct. And they judge Israel in day seven, no? No. Mm -mm. Day eight. Because it says they'll do that in Matthew. It gives you the timeline. It says they'll sit on these thrones when he sits in the throne of his glory, which is not until day eight, which means they can't sit either. Because remember, he's not judging Israel himself. They can't because he they can't judge until he judges. So you can't precede him, right? So he's not judging Israel until the end. And that's when it says he'll gather the seditious people, the seditious people, iniquitous people out of his kingdom. Because he's judging at the end of his kingdom reign. He's judging, taking people out of his kingdom. So and he's taking the tares out from the wheat at the end. Remember at the end of the harvest? Remember? That's the end. The chaff at the, at the beginning separated from in the heavenlies, and the tares are separated from the earth at the end of his kingdom, taken out of his kingdom. So, And then he goes and judges from the heavenlies over Israel, and the 12 apostles are over that as well. So he is judging them, ruling, I should say, ruling over them on the earth, but he's not judging them because he gives them an entire thousand years to put forth the fruit to get toward that wife of God status. So the, I guess the difference between ruling and judging is the demarcation there. He's ruling over them for a thousand years in his Masonic reign, from which then he then judges them to see how, how he assisted them by faith and sight, by ruling over them to get the fruit they need. And he's going to judge to have them see, did you bear the requisite fruits to have the good judgment set of you? Yes. They're correct. They're not the correct. They're ruling, but they're not judging. That's correct. So you're talking about one sixteen Colossians, you said? Because in him were created all things, those in heavens and those on the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all things have been created for through him and for Yeah, he's talking about here that's a general that is like Vicky just said, I think Vicky kinda answered your question, sister sister Pam. That you can have a throne that's there, like God's throne right now is in heaven. doesn't mean that he's judging us right now, right? So you can have a throne without having a judgment. That's the difference, I think. You can, you can, be, you can have a throne without judgment being exercised. But you can't have a throne without rulership being exercised. That's insane. If there's a throne and someone's sitting in it, well, they're ruling. Let's get real. So, but it doesn't mean they're judging, though. And that's the thing right now, for example, we have with God himself who sits on his throne upon high. He's not judging us. He's held that over to the sun to be later on. And he, when he goes to his Bema seat, he judges us. But that's why when he sits on the earth at the throne of his father David, he doesn't judge. He's ruling. He's ruling. Now, there's judgments that he makes. There's a parsing out words here. There's judgments that he makes, 
but he's not judging from a, when you say the word judging, he's talking about the finality or the, the permanency of something that he delivers out to lead into a merit for one's deeds. There's a more of a determination being made where he's doing his rulership. He's doing determinations and judgments, but the judging of one's permanency, of one's life, in the balance, that's the beam of seat, that's the great white throne. I mean, those are two different things. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense to you or not, but that's, there's a, they're parsing out words a little bit, but, but rulership would be different than judging. There's a bottom line to that. Just like, again, that's where you have ruling and reigning versus just ruling. Because he rules and reigns from earth, but he rules in heaven, but he reigns on the earth because he's putting out determinations and deliberations on, on the earth, which there are some judgments involved with that, but he's not judging per se the finality, giving people more chances and more chances. Hence, that's why there's the Aaronic priesthood being instituted, so they have a chance to continue to put forth animal sacrifice to cover their sin. So he's putting forth judgments, but not he's not judging them in a final state. That's not what's happening, because people get chances and upon chances all day long. And again, we know that because he said, let the tares and the wheat grow together until the end. And then, at the end of the harvest, that's when I'll pull the people out of the, the iniquitous people out of my kingdom. So therefore, he tells you by matter of fact. He doesn't judge the, par the final judgment. It's not until the end. He makes judgments, if you will, or determinations, but not the same thing. So I'm not parsing out and confusing things for you. I'm just trying to be delineating the, the, the words a little bit differently to help to, to expound on it. I don't know if that helps or not. I don't know. You tell me. So did I answer that question? I don't know <laughs> anymore. <laughs> did I answer that question? Yes or no, Todd? So this question here, answer your question. I don't know. Day eight. Judge the angels in day eight. He judged the angels in day eight. But so Pam and Vicky, does that answer the question? Todd asked and asked you. Did I did I answer Vicky the question? Vicky said okay. And again, the reason why. If you're wondering why, is because this, the, the inheritance is not set yet. You're, the, the angels occupy places of inheritance or they are used as advocates to help us inherit. And therefore, until the inheritance has been earned, you cannot judge a person when their job's not done yet. Their job's not done until the end of day seven. And those in the heavenlies got the benefactor and the result of their inheritance, which is the bride. So at the end of that inheritance, of have earth already had theirs, and now heaven has theirs, then the angels would be judged by those in the heavens. And that's why it's not until day eight, because you can't judge until everything's been done. You can't evaluate the job until it's done. The job is done, then you evaluate. That's what's happening. So the, the job of the angels is to occupy the inheritance position and to help us to, to then ascend to those places. And that does not end, that job does not end until the end of day seven. And then you then then they're judged. By a few, not by everybody. Yes. And uh, Vicky said okay, Pam said sure, and Vicky said okay, sure. And Todd said, Do you judge the good and the bad angels? I wouldn't say the bad ones. That's an interesting question. I don't know. I wouldn't say the bad ones. I don't think that's the case because you're only judging those from a standpoint of their obedience to. I think Pam just said fallen. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. And the reason I say that is because uh, when, when Michael the archangel uh, said, you know, for the body of Moses, let, let the Lord rebuke you. I mean, he, he makes it pretty clear that the, the evil demonic side of the um, realm has a different authority relationship to God that I think he does that. <laughs> he deals with that judgment of that with, with disobedient people, which really speaks to the mind, by the way, of our understanding of how God says in the next life, 
even when we go beyond this life, we still have to continue to obey or we could lose our place in heaven. People say, what? You're, well, think about it. If, if, in fact, a sinless being has no need to worry about falling from, from grace, then we've always used the Garden of Eden as an example. Then before that, you had the anointed cherub that covereth as an example. Then you had the angels that he took with them as an example. So we have anointed cherub that covereth. We have the angelic host in heaven that both of them who are sinless fell. We have, we have hot Adam and Eve with no sin inside them got involved in sin because of sin temptation from without. But then you have this other illusion in the New Testament when it says you're judging angels. Why would you judge an angel if in fact there's nothing they could ever do that's ever wrong or incomplete or inefficient or insufficient? Why, why would you judge them if the grade's going to be uh, A, uh, A, uh, 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 A, then why are you judging them then? That's just an exercise in futility. God judges us because there's a different outcome for each of the merit of our deeds, right? So he's given you a huge hint there. Different angels have different merits of their deeds. Hello. So if that's the case, then hello. Why wouldn't you in the same heavenly realm during day seven have not had that experience, which is why those who understood that and ascended are the ones who do the judging of the angels because they acutely are aware of what it is on both sides of the fence. Sinful, sinless, how to deal with obedience to God. And that's why they're uniquely qualified to tell the angels this is what was expected. Yes? It's hard to how do we judge because we have angels of God say so much better than we <laughs> do or can say what we do with our flesh. And that's why and I'm not saying you're going to judge the angels or I'm going to judge you. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's a unique group of people. There's a unique group of people amongst those who inherit the heavenlies as the bride. Amongst that group, there's a unique group of people. The bride will be a part of those people that the bride and the friends of the bridegroom will judge those angels. And so that group of people will have been uniquely qualified. To your point, no one can judge them now. No one can judge them later. Only the bride, and only the bride because of what Ephesians 5 says, because the Lord has cherished her, because the Lord has sanctified her, because the Lord has washed and nourished her, because the Lord has prepared, has established, has, has grown, has edified, has done everything to make her, hopefully us, into a different type of person. You have been now qualified to now judge the angels. But remember, we saw last week in Colossians, he qualifies us. He puts us in a position to be in that place. We don't do that. He does that. So you have a great point. There is nothing you could do, and there is nothing that you can compare that makes it so that you're worthy to judge an angel. You're right. You're not. Neither am I. No one is. But the reality is that God puts us in a place to qualify us to do that. That's all about the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. He puts certain people in places to do that so that they are uniquely qualified in a sinful body and in a sinless body and then ascended to the ranks of the bride. He goes, now those are the ones qualified and they're going to judge my angels because they have unique insight into both sides of the fence, how they were the subordinate and how they were an equal and how it was to enter heaven in sinlessness but now to ascend to a level above them, they get to now put a determination out that be justified because they can see it from a fullness, holistic viewpoint that an angel would never understand. Because an angel, will, an angel will never understand redemption. They will never experience it. So therefore, that's one thing they'll have over them. And they'll also never understand intimacy with the Lord as the bride will. They'll never understand that. A second thing they'll have over them. And thirdly, because of that, they'll never understand the same knowledge that you will at that point. And therefore, there's my third reason why you would judge them. Because of your ability to experience what they can never experience, your ability to ascend to an intimate level that they can never ascend to, and because of it, your ability to know the Lord God Creator better than they ever could. And those are the three reasons I submit to you why some people, not all, will be qualified because God will qualify him through those ways unto the bride, then that 
those group of people will then be the ones judging. Hope that answers your question. Please. Now, Ricky said, um, like Stephen Curry's Chapman song, Angels, Angels Wish, Angels will tell us about creation, and we will tell them the story of grace. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, see, they have the upper hand on us right now. But the reality is that when you ascend to the heavenlies and enter, then you get to be an inheritor of the heavenlies. It, there's nothing that they know that you won't know. Not everybody, but that group that becomes the bride, there's nothing. That's what it means to me. And there's Because it tells you that wherever the bride goes, those 144,000, wherever the lamb, lamb goes, they go. That's not said about the angels. That's not said about them. They don't have that intimate closeness with the Lord as these these faithful ones do. So I'm just telling you that I, b I can see in the scripture there's a uniqueness of tightness of oneness which speaks to a bride and bridegroom oneness that, that we have the opportunity to share which is why it's a greater opportunity than they'll ever have which is why it is a qualifying event if, again to judge them. So yeah, you're right. They'll, they can tell us about that all they want but then there's going to be a time where the teacher becomes the student because right now we're the students and they're the teachers. But in day seven, we're still the students. But in day eight, you get to be the bride, you become the teacher now of others that were once your teacher. In that case, the angels. Because they're going, you know what? Well, yeah, because I'm closer to him that you've served that you've never knew. Let me tell you what he has told me. Not because I'm better than you, because I'm not. I'm just more blessed than you, that's all. Let me tell you what he told me. Let me tell you what about him that you talk about, but now I know more what you mean when you say da 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 